Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Bennett. Each episode, we talk about the research and practical aspects of the trauma informed movement. This podcast is not designed to replace mental health services. If you feel uncomfortable or triggered by our discussion, please consider seeking your own trauma treatment. In no way is seeking treatment an admission of weakness, it is a chance to build resiliency and experience post traumatic growth. You can find show notes, resources, and more at Trauma Informed. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Jeff Summers here with my partner in crime, Matt Bennett. Hey, hey Matt. Jeff. Just want to welcome uh, all my uh, friends from the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast as well. So this is our our third crossover, uh, I guess fourth overall, but third uh, crossover on this uh, uh, series. So uh, good to be back with you again, my friend. That's right. We're going to wrap up the job resources and demands conversation today, which I'm looking forward to. Um, it's been uh, one of the most highly viewed in the series of podcasts so far, which is, uh, which is interesting and I think telling of, of where the world is right now. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought it to everybody's attention. Yeah, so um, a little stress going on, I, I guess. So yes, yeah, uh, a lot of lot of demands in yes. life these days. Yeah, and, and I think it just you know I, I'm hoping other people really see the benefit of breaking down uh, burnout uh, into kind of basically equations, like like we were talking about. Just a, a quick review of you know if the job demands, which includes the stress uh, and the helping healing professions we talk about, the empathetic intensity, the emotional kind of wear and tear from the work as well, is that if uh, job resources, and we've also, you know, because I can't leave a good enough model alone, I added self-care on top of that um, as well, is, you know, if, if the, the stress of the work uh, overwhelms the resources and the self-care, that's where we get people uh, moving to burnout. So it gives us a really... A uh, simple equation. I like those little the alligator eats. Like if job demands are greater than the resources and self care, you probably got somebody who's at least vulnerable to burnout, but but likely moving into that at least if that continues over time. Whereas if the job resources and self care adequately address the stress inherent to the work, you've got the capacity for engagement. So, you know, again, very, I, I love, you know, I'm not the smartest dude in the world, never claim to be. So to simplify it, uh, uh, I think really gives us concrete things uh, to work with. So in this kind of final episode, Jeff, I, I wanna talk about uh, the role of leadership and uh, organizational culture in this as well, because it's kind of easy. And we, we talked about this in the last episode is, you know, when you think about HR policies like time off, uh, livable wage, professional development, you know, th those are really in, in some ways concrete things uh, for us to hold. You can Google what's a livable wage in Denver, Colorado and, and get that number. Uh, you can have an employee assistance program where your folks have access to free therapy. You, you know, you can check these things off the list. But organizational culture is, is a little bit of a, uh, if you say a softer uh, concept here. And one sure. where, you know, I'm, I'm gonna speak to both, uh, if you're a teammate of folks, speak to you, but also leadership as well. Because one of the things that as I'm going through this and, and really try to integrate my several decades now of research on, on leadership is, you know, the, 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 the approach of the leader becomes a job resource. Um, you know, we know that in, man, I might get this number wrong. I believe it's 75% of folks uh, state that their leader is the most stressful part of their work. Um, so leaders- And, and, and the, yeah, yeah. people leave, you know, the, the old saying, people leave managers that only jobs, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and I loved it, like they, they did this other survey um, that what's the worst part of your day and the number one thing and they like threw in picking up dog poop uh, on the <laughs> well, like they tried too, but overall it was spending time with my supervisor um, is that then right it, That's yeah then, then it gets the scary one. of that about I think it was 24 percent and another survey said they were they'd been bullied by uh, a yeah. supervisor and that's we're talking traumatic at that point and 
Well, I'm, I'm actually know. surprised it's that low, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, you know, right. The experiences and, I've had, uh, I would have guessed higher. Sadly. Yeah, and, and, and that's dramatic for a lot of folks because your supervisor, maybe, you know, basically directly, but at least indirectly, is uh, allows you to meet your basic needs, uh, to feed your family, to pay your mortgage, to pay your rent. So there, there is, I think it's just important to say there is a lack of good leadership based on the statistics. Uh, another thing is over a fourth of folks uh, would fire their supervisor if they had the power to do so. Now, nobody probably thinks that they're talking about them, right? We have this bias of course. that, that uh, is absolutely. well documented. It is like, you, you know, Jeff, are, are you the average salesperson or are you above average? And if you ask salespeople that, you, you know, pretty much everybody is going to say, I'm, I'm at least average, but I'm above average. But nobody really says, yeah, I pretty much stink at this. It's like, <laughs> what kind of romantic lover are you? Nobody says I'm the worst. Like I'm in the bottom <laughs> 10 percentile. Like everybody says they're above average lover. Like, so we have this bias, but one out of four people, if you're listening to this as a supervisor, uh, statistics say that uh, at least some of your folks would fire you if they, they had the power to do so. So, so we can really look at, you know, leadership can, can be a source of stress and add more job demand. So if my time spent with a supervisor is, is much more stressful than it is supportive, it's going to be a job demand that reinforces burnout. Now, you know, other we can look at it the other way, and this is kind of a tricky thing, but I think the important thing to understand, if my supervisor is more a source of support than stress. Now, because we're going to hold both of those, right? You know, even though, hey, I was a supervisor with a, a degree that I could call myself a therapist. Hey, if you didn't get what you need to get done that we needed to get you to have done, I'm going to be a source of stress that day. Now, I hope okay. more often than not, I'm a sense of support. And in sure. my opinion, at least, if I'm more a sense of stress, it means you're not doing what you need to do. Now, again, I have to be careful because my staff might experience me in a very, very different way. Because of course, Jeff, I am an above average leader, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, and yeah, I mean, and you have to be cognizant of, are you giving them, so you've got these expectations of output, yes. but are you giving them the tools and the support they need to actually meet those expectations? And so, yeah, that's that's the interesting part about it, too. You know, getting back to everybody thinks they're above average. They may think that the employee has enough support. The employee right. doesn't. And that's a big disconnect. And, and that's yep. going to cause some serious problems. Abs absolutely. And flying blind. And, and there's been some studies that really relate uh, bad leadership to to. I mean, we, we've looked and talked about the impact of burnout, but but there's been nice studies. Really, uh, when I say nice, I mean uh, statistically valid studies they really equate poor leadership with heart disease and heart attack. So, so this has a real life uh, hit. We know we've talked about that job stress is killing us. And if the supervisor or leader is the greatest source of stress, you, you know, you don't have to go too far to say bad leadership is killing people. Um, yeah. And again, that's, that's a nice thing, you know, for me as a presenter to put on a slide. Uh, it gets sure. people's Click attention, bait. but- Clickbait. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is, but it, it's also, you know, I, 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 I've got the, I've got the studies to to back that up. So right. when we talk about leadership, and so when we talk about the job resources, and this is where, again, I'm sharing the slides with you. Uh, we'll we'll put this again um, if you're listening to this and not on YouTube with us. Um, you can you can look at the uh, show notes. Uh, uh, optimalhrv.com will get you those show notes uh, on our website page, as well as uh, uh, what's my other podcast called? Uh, Traumainformedlens.org. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, if you look at the job resource box, there's this diagonal area up into job demands, which, as we've talked about, is approaches that we do to mitigate the the stress that's inherent to any job. So. As a leader, I challenge leaders uh, a few things that I see popping out in the research is one, that, that you're a mindful leader. Um, you know, we've talked about mindfulness both as a, a practice. I, I always compare it to shooting free throws in basketball. You know, I practice free throws so when I'm under stress, I can bring that skill into the stressful event, you know, which is a game in free throws. But if things get stressful at work, 
we want our leaders to be uh, the calm in the so storm, uh, so to speak. So, so bringing mindful calm into stressful situations, uh, humility, uh, honesty is a tricky one, but, but I think it's such a key piece of this that also uh, helps to lead to engagement. Uh, great study. Uh, there's been a book that I, it's in this fourth or fifth edition now. I've, I've lost track of the editions uh, called The Leadership Challenge. And they have done surveys uh, across the world about what, what do people want from their leaders. And the number one uh, result over all these decades, over all these different industries, and it really trounces the, the, the next closest thing is honesty. Um, whereas, you know, honesty, one, is not lying to folks, but it's also to, to give uh, honest feedback, to, to address things when they fi fall out of lines with expectations. And so, you know, looking at that honesty and then just discipline. Um, if you ever work for a leader who, you know, their mood determines uh, whether or not you have a great day or a horrible day, that's a hor that's pretty terrible uh, work situation to do. So our Definitely. consistency of message, our consistency of, we bring in an emotional, this is where mindfulness again comes in. We bring in our emotional regulated self. So people don't have to guess, are we in a good mood today or are we in a bad mood today as well? And really what we wanna bring as a resource, both to promote engagement, but also to mitigate stress is trust. Um, that's what we're trying to do. We know- That's it, I mean, that's, that, that's yeah. what it all boils down to. Any, any relationship, you know. Yep. You gotta be honest to, to have trust and, and if you feel secure, you gotta trust the, uh, the relationship you're in with your, your manager, leadership, whatever it is. I mean, and it's your direct leader as well as the organization as, as a whole. If, if you don't trust either one has your best interest, then you're never going to be fully engaged. Absolutely. So, so we, we talked about when we were with people we trust, we release oxytocin, uh, calms down the amygdala. In other words, helps you uh, be emotionally regulated. So one of the best, we call this co-regulation in psychology. Basically, if not the best, it's in the top one or two uh, or three to ways for most of us to regulate uh, our stress response is getting support from other people. Um, your supervisor is teammates also key to this, but we just know through a lot of research is the supervisor plays their, their role is uh, more weighted, uh, more important when we look at, at the research. Um, and so when you have a supportive supervisor who, yeah, you know, cares about your performance, cares about your professional development, uh, wants you to be healthy, implements all those HR policies and stuff we've talked about in the last one, but also that you just have a good relationship with, uh, we know that that's going to, again, set the stage because not only does oxytocin help mitigate the stress response, it also um, encourages prefrontal cortex activity. So more insight, uh, more, if we could use the word, which is the box that is kind of the goal here, um, more engagement. Um, you know, when we're working something collectively, uh, you know, we're, we're more engaged. Uh, you know, Jeff, both of us being sports fans, uh, the t most talented team doesn't always win the championship. Um, no. You, you know, and, and you see, you know, the locker rooms are uh, really important. Uh, you know, do, do you have good team chemistry uh, is so crucial. And then the same goes for a, a business or work environment as well. And, and again, the, the coach often is the one who either keeps their job or loses their job, depending mm -hmm. on that sort of, uh, sort of what the business literature would say is, you know, the organizational culture of, of what we what we create and those relationships we create with each other um, as well. The other piece this really leads to is uh, we've talked about as well in this podcast, psychological safety is, is do I feel like my voice is heard? Do I feel like I can take a risk and maybe voice a different opinion without being made fun of or getting in trouble for it. And, right. you know, I, I believe I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but we're talking from a business perspective. Uh, Google, who has a lot of cash in the bank to run really good studies, wanted to, to find out why some of their teams really thrived and others didn't. Um, and, and maybe we're average, uh, we're okay, but, but what made great teams at Google great 
um, wasn't the degrees, wasn't the years of experience. It was psychological safety rose straight to the top. So um, that, that they felt like their voices were heard um, moving forward. So, you know, we, we start to build these pieces and being part of teams now, again, leaders play an outweighed role in the development of this, just like a coach with an athletic team. But uh, do we trust each other? Do we support each other? Do we allow for healthy uh, conflict uh, within our teams? And so, you know, a lot of times these psychological concepts like trust, psychological safety um, may sort of get shrugged off in, in the business literature. Boy, you know, like I said, when Google puts several million dollars into studying this, uh, here they come right up to the top again. Gallup, uh, who's done the Gallup 12 surveys, uh, same basic things, you know, having a best friend at work as a predictor of organizational engagement. Uh, what the heck, right? Uh, but, you know, whether or not your uh, supervisor, leader sees, uh, cares about your well being is one of the number one predictors about organizational engagement. Uh, you know, my friends, these psychological things that uh, folks like me spend a lot of time studying and, and implementing you know, they, they work in the business environment as well. So, you know, I like to think about this again, these two areas coming out of job resources. One is the relationships that we have within the organization are going to be one of the best ways that we can mitigate the stress inherent to any job. At the same time, we get a double benefit of working on organizational culture is that they also are the exact things that lead to an engaged workforce. So, so not only do we mitigate, but we also move forward as well. The other thing, Jeff, that, that I see with the relationship piece, and this is where people are like, oh, Matt's so touchy-feely about this stuff. And this is, <laughs> this is where I don't, and it's accountability. Uh, High-performing cultures, we talked a, a little bit about like recognition. We ended our last episode with that. Uh, Trauma-informed cultures uh, or high-performing cultures are um, high accountability cultures. Um, so when we step outside, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define this a little bit more in a second, our shared values or our shared expectations, um, we uh, hold each other accountable. Uh, now we want to make sure that we don't, and this is tricky, as we don't see an individual behavior as isolated to that individual. So when I train leaders on accountability, I want you to look for the bigger issues. Yeah, somebody might have done something dumb, but why? Like why? <laughs> Take a step back. Where's sure. the level of trust and psychological safety? Uh, thinking, and, and sometimes, and, and Jeff, you can probably relate to this, you know, as a supervisor, once I got about 10 years of experience, why did a good staff do something totally stupid? you know, about eight out of 10 times, it's because they weren't getting enough sleep. They, they had a new kid at home. They they had a sick I kid. Can like absolutely relate to that. Uh, yeah. I 100%. mean, we, 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 we talked about that in the sleep episode is lack of sleep's like being drunk. Um, yep. And so if you see drunk behavior at work, it could be sleep. Now, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's alcohol. That's exactly. It, it could be alcohol too. I've seen that happen. It as could, well. of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, doesn't but, have uh, to be. But, but again, that doesn't mean that that behavior is okay to repeat. We need to have a conversation. But also, you know, I might come in with, you know, what about some time off, you know, so you can freaking take a nap on a Friday, you know, you yeah. know, really strategizing. Obviously, you have a new kid at home. I know I'm probably not going to get the best of you for a while. But, but how do I strategize with you to support you to say, hey, I know you're going to come in. You need eight hours of sleep. You're only going to get five, you know. So well, what's the strategy? How do we work through this collectively? And again, if you got trust and psychological safety, uh, you can have that conversation because it's much better to be honest with somebody than them trying to kind of fake their way through, uh, you know, not the being sleep deprived or going through a trauma in, in their well, own life. Yeah, so, and for them to feel okay about it, you know, knowing yeah. that the, you know, the organization understands what they're going through personally, that they're to support and, you know, don't don't make a, a bad situation worse by Absolutely. making the person feel bad about it, or you know, trying too hard to overcome it when it's just not working. Can't 
can't overcome a lack of sleep. It's if you got a baby at home, that's just the way it goes. And, you know, exactly. You exactly. So, you so, so you're you're managing that with the person. You know how how do you work through it? And again, that's where that honesty, that's where the trust comes in because it's not you know. And again, this is where accountability. Yeah, we've got to. It doesn't mean my expectations of you have changed, but how can I work with you to make sure you're capable of meeting those expectations in the best way? Uh, possible. Knowing that we'll all, as a non-breeder myself, hey, there's things that have happened in my life uh, that have also impacted my my performance. So, you right. know, it's it's not like, hey, I, you know, the, the sleep one and having kids is the easiest, most concrete example uh, sure. to give. But, you, but, you know, you might have an old we, parent, you might have, right. you know, all kinds of things that are going to affect you. Absolutely. And, and, you know, to own it yourself as a leader uh, or as a teammate who might be having an accountability conversation with somebody is, did, did I play any role in this behavior? And what we're looking for, Jeff, here, when I, when I teach people on accountability, one is if you're the person holding someone else accountable, you're often pissed off at the time, right? They probably did something that- <laughs> Something happened that didn't meet your expectations and now I, you're frustrated about it. It may have cost you money, may have hurt your brand, uh, might have treated a client patient student in a way that might've been uh, um, harmful it, to some extent. So, so yep. yeah, so one is, hey leaders, if you're getting stressed out, you need to stop and step back because you can do serious harm. Um, then look for the bigger issues because so much of our behavior is a manifestation of a system issue or an underlying problem that you don't know yet know about. So, you know, if you do something stupid in a meeting and I just hold you accountable for the behavior without knowing, hey, you only got four hours of sleep last night because you got a sick kid at home or you're, you know, maybe going through relational problems or you got a parent that just got diagnosed, right? That behavior is going to keep continuing because I'm, don't have the information I need to really, you know, help you work through that experience. So um, accountability here is key. It leads to engagement. Um, also, a part of this is shared expectations, making sure um, that people know what's expected from you. I always give people the homework of, you know, next time you meet with your staff, uh, ask them, you know, what, what are the expectations uh, that, that the staff feel like is inherent to their job? Uh, and see what the answer you get. Uh, because research says that most don't really know what's expected from them and most don't ask for clarification. So shared expectation falls on the leader. And again, if your job description, the last bullet point is all other things as of assigned, it's pretty much a worthless document, uh, at least from a neurobiological perspective, because going in and washing my car is technically part of your job description if that's the last bullet point. So, so getting concrete with that, because if we don't have shared expectations, especially when we move to like HR policy write-ups, uh, it's kind of unethical if we haven't established shared expectations. Uh, so uh, a little work for a lot of leaders to do. Um, the other piece here, Jeff, that, that I sort of see, and, and this is where there's a lot of work in here and a lot of times these are, these get kind of shelved in the team building corporate retreat box <laughs> and then they sit on a shelf. Trust falls? What are, you, are you gonna talk about trust falls? <laughs> <laughs> not, not a little bit better than that. A little <laughs> bit better than that. Uh, you know, but shared values and shared vision. Um, you know, and these are two really critical things. And, and you know, so when we talk about you know, engagement. This is really what we're talking about. We, last time we talked about positive growth mindset, democracy, recognition, all those things. So these two are taking that foundation of trust, both from a mitigating stress, but also promoting engagement and then adding rocket fuel to it. Um, so when we talk about shared values, how do we act in this team? How do we act in this organization? And think about that. If you haven't really established that, you're missing out on something. And, and besides recognition, I, I got to go back occasionally and just really review the research on shared values because there's such a competitive advantage. And when I say shared values, this is where my retreat snarky comment comes in. 
if you've mm -hmm. got shared values, that means your staff can recite your values. If you did them at a retreat and they sit on a shelf collecting dust, they're not okay. shared. But but this so, talks. Go ahead, go for it, Jeff. Uh, no, so so just so you know, for the folks who maybe aren't too familiar with the difference. Um, and maybe you're going here and I've, I've sort of interrupted your flow a little bit, but maybe you can kind of give examples of, you know, what, what shared values are versus what a shared vision is because they're, they're similar, but they're, they're different. And there's important differences that people need to keep in mind. So, so, so I got great, almost one or two liner, which is unlike me. So um, <laughs> shared vision is where your group, where your uh, company is going. So, so and, and a vision, unlike just a strategic plan, because really a vision is, let, let's say, hey, we're, we're about at this time of year, um, the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl is the shared vision. It's going to push us. We're all going to have to do our best pretty much every day in order to accomplish this. We're going to have to work hard. We're going to have to work smart. We're going to have to have a great team chemistry. We got to hold each other accountable to get there. So, so in many ways, if you think about it, that is your, that is the vision is where you're going. The shared values is what, what guides your behavior to get there. So this is where ethics and morals come into play. And, and shared values are things that if you're going to change them to meet the demands of the market, you better be really careful. Um, these really hold us in an ethical space, no matter what is blowing in the environment. So this tells everybody on the team, in the organization, this is how we act. Then accountability comes in that if somebody's behavior veers outside those shared values, they're, they're kind of meta expectations, so to speak, that we hold everybody back accountable for, for getting their behavior back in line with the values. So, so you can kind of put the pieces together here is shared vision is really the, the goal that really pulls us into a future that really excites us, right? Uh, to, you know, when, when we start Optimo HRV, we really think this technology um, can save people's lives, can prevent relapse, can prevent suicide. So, so you know, our, our vision is we, we really think there's life-saving. Uh, this, this technology is life-saving. Um, we can also help uh, create healthy organizations, especially in some of the high-stress uh, uh, fields uh, that we're targeting. And we know a healthy workforce is going to be able to make better decisions that also can save lives. So, you know, when we think about integrating biometrics into the helping and healing professions, you know, and sort of being the gold standard, not because we did a good job at marketing, but because we created a, a great app that's very usable for folks, that, that's, a, that's a vision that pulls me every day. You've got me right now going through my LinkedIn contacts, sending out. So I'm, I'm a sales guy right now, which I've realized, <laughs> boy, you know, I just thought Jeff went to fancy meetings, uh, you know, made a lot of money, just... Oh man, I got a lot more respect for you, my brother, than I did. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of uh, a lot more work than most people realize. Oh, man. Sure. I'll, I'll just look so glorious, uh, you know, flying in your business class in your suits. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've got I've got a lot more respect for you uh, after my uh, week of sales. Uh, you, you know, but but that's what pulls me, right? I, I'm I'm okay going through uh, the sales process you having me going through because I know if people are aware of what we're doing you know, we, we could help save lives. We could improve services uh, for folks. So, so that really in many ways pulls you, whereas the values say, this is how we're going to behave on the way. Now, obviously, shared expectations help uh, make that more concrete because the values is going to be six or seven values that are going to help you get there. So one of our values that we said is, is wellness. So not only do we want to help the world be a healthier place, but we need to live that value in our own organization every day as well. So we can put it in context. How do we structure meetings? How do we think about next product developments? That value guides us. Now, you know, expectations and a concrete strategy, whether that's 
a strategic plan, whether it's the plan we've done for future versions of, of the app, you know, we need to make that concrete because neither a vision or values is going to tell you exactly how is the, the sales team going to help us get there? How's the development team? How's the therapist and the physicians and the nurses going to help us all get to that shared? So, so that's where some of those more concrete uh, pieces of the business world uh, come into play. But again, um, that positive outcomes, you know, the shared vision is means you're just rocking it, right? You, the positive outcome for a, a football team right now, win the Super Bowl, right? That, that gets people out of bed in the morning. That gets people excited. That gets people, you know, both of us being here in Denver who uh, spend all their disposable income, not on their dentistry um, or their healthcare, but on Bronco season tickets, right? So <laughs> even as fans, we will spend way too much money that makes any logical sense. And Bronco fans are just insane because some of those tickets have been in their family for like 150 years or whatever <laughs> crazy amount it's been. And, but, but we want to be part of that. That's why even though the Broncos really haven't had much of a football team to speak of in the last few years, I, I, we're, we're, we're selling every ticket that's available in, for that stadium, right? And probably, you know, as we know Bronco fans, if everybody could have showed up at the stadium, you know, screw the pandemic. We're all, uh, we're all going to the game. So, so, you know, this is what really pulls us. So when we talk about this job resource, yeah, there's going to be job demands. And part of that's going to be the strategic plan on how we approach our vision. Now that, that pushing ourselves is going to elicit stress, but it's also going to push us towards engagement as well. It's again, using the football analogy, it's why we practice hard. It's why we work out in the preseason. Yeah, that, that's going to add stress, but it's also going to give me uh, uh, really, hey, what am I going to do every day to reach those outcomes? So, so again, we're, we're working with these equations, but you know, things that promote engagement, again, talking about shared value, shared vision, uh, you know, as along with democracy, collaborative decision-making, positive and growth mindsets, recognition, all that, again, built upon that trust, uh, psychological safety is going to serve as the foundation. And for those that do anything that has customers, clients, patients, students involved with it, then that, what I always like to say is, you know, we create this organizational culture and the healthier that is, the healthier our climate is. And, and that's what our customers, our clients, our patients what they feel when they walk through the doors, what they feel when they meet us on a Zoom call. Because we know, again, we've talked about this a lot, emotions are contagious. And so, you know, it's also what people are going to feel when they, they come across our teammates and ourselves um, as well. So, again, all of this comes into play when we talk about motivation. Um, and, and really, the end result is uh, mitigating the burnout so we can get to positive outcomes. Um, and, and that's really, again, leadership, yeah, it's about having a good strategic plan. It's about having a good, big, hairy, audacious goal or whatever you want to call it. It's, it is about managing your finances well. All those things really come into play. But again, when we talk about employee engagement, motivation, positive outcomes, how well are we helping folks to manage the stress inherent to their jobs? Um, again, we can, we can scaffold this with a lot of things including HRV, but again, it really falls a lot back on that trust and psychological safety. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. You know, so much of it is, um, you know, like we talked about, it, it, it's, it's sort of simple stuff, yeah. but, you know, when you, you, you sort of talk about it on a more macro level and you bring some of the studies that you've talked about into it, it becomes, you know, even more resonant, you know, it almost gets back to the golden rule in some extent, you know. Yeah. How do you want to be treated? Let's let's treat other people that way, and all these components kind of get make that up. And and sadly, being a part of many organizations through you know the various startups I've worked for that have grown and gotten acquired, um, you, you you don't see a, a lot of these practices really being put into place, which is a shame because it's not difficult and it you know it should be something everyone's a lot more focused on than they are. But you know they're. They're worried about making numbers. They're worried about, you know, releasing software. They're worried about, you know, whatever it is that they do. Um, you know, this stuff to them, like you said, is quote unquote soft. Yeah. But if you really start to understand the quantification of the impact, 
It's far from it. It really is. I mean, I mean, this is the game, whether you're treating patients, whether you're doing code, uh, you know, and again, this is where HRV can come in. If, if your HRV is crashing, which the great thing is, we can really, especially get a nice baseline, uh, we can tell when people are in that exhaustion stage of burnout, right? We, we can see, you know, as we, we talked about in the book is like if your seven day average is starting to kind of get into yellow or red uh, where it's significantly below your all time average, you're at risk. Now, again, it, it may be that you're not handling some stuff in your personal life, like not getting enough sleep and a lot of other things. But right. all of a sudden, what we see is, hey, here's a person that's not going to be able to give their best self to their work at this point. So if we could have an early warning sign with that, because job demands are not a static thing. You know, yep. you'll have deadlines come in, Absolutely. you'll have, Changes you know, you'll have a crisis come in. So, so this isn't just, you know, you, you do this and then it's set. No, those job demands are always going to fluctuate, which means resources are going to ebb and flow and change over time. And how do you know what worked last week is working even this week? Uh, HRV can give you a great measurement of that. It, it really can show is if you got folks in the green performing at or above their own baseline and their population norm, you know you have the capacity for an engaged workforce. Now, now your leadership management approaches, are you going to maximize that cognitive sure. Uh, potential that you have. Again, it does. HRV doesn't say you're going to get to uh, positive outcomes, but now do your leadership approaches that you have an emotionally regulated, do they create motivation for excellence? And so again, this is where sometimes the business world pisses me off is there, there is, there is as much, I mean, I'm reading like a 500 page book of just uh, meta studies. So studies on studies about uh, this model and you know, you want correlation, you want causation, uh, it's all there. And so if you really need to get good outcomes, you got to pay attention to stress you, you, because you need people in your prefrontal cortex in every job I can possibly think of. Emotional regulation is going to be a key part of that. We know what to do. Are you willing to do it? And do you have the skill set? And I think, Jeff, that's the that's yep. the big thing. Um, you know, that's the benefit. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a, uh, a therapist with an MBA, uh, you know, and I feel like, you know, on a good day, I have the skills to keep a workforce <laughs> healthy, you know, and I, I'll be honest especially with you. Large, you know, especially these folks responsible for really large scale workforces. I mean, that's yeah. a whole, it's one thing when it's 30 people, 300 people, 3,000 people, yes. about 30,000 people. You know? Yeah. And so you may be managing the health of your managers who are then hopefully managing the yeah, health absolutely. of maybe another level of management. And That's this is where culture amazing. becomes the accumulation of that. That's and right. there's, there's another uh, that you brought that up, this idea in systems theory called parallel processes, which means, you know, uh, characteristics in one part of a system are replicated throughout the system. And if there is any dysfunction, don't think because you're a leader, you don't get a focus on self-care because if there's dysfunction at the leadership level, that's gonna trickle down. We call that, I, I, well, a term I like to use, but it's called in the traumas is spilling stress. And that's gonna flood stress everywhere. So there's even a hyper-focus when you get up. The executive team's not immune from this. In fact, no, the dynamics of the executive it. team are going to be replicated throughout the rest of the organization. And if you ever talk to middle managers, uh, maybe one out of every two talk about in some language, I need to protect my staff from the rest of the organization. Well, mm -hmm. I understand that. I've been in that position before. And while I was able to maybe get positive outcomes in the short term, no middle manager has a strong enough umbrella to um, over a long period of time, protect their staff Maybe you could you could argue an exception to the rule, but the rule is, you know, uh, that the dysfunction in the organization is going to overwhelm those positive efforts, because eventually holding up that umbrella gets uh, gets you a burned out manager, and so you, you, you can't win. Absolutely, you know, you're constantly in conflict. You you it's, are, and there's and, no and resources much, that are going to yeah. be provided that. Uh, we're going to meet that demand. Yep. And how much time is going to protecting your staff versus focusing on engagement, motivation, 
positive outcomes. So your job resources are more directed to managing, you know, the job demands of a, you know, you want to burn people out, a negative organizational culture. If you put a middle manager in this, they're they're putting so much effort into mitigating the negative impact of that culture that they have less ability to really focus on shared visions and things that are going to lead to, to great outcomes. So, you know, we, we've got this model. We've got HRV to measure this model, which is exciting. Now, Jeff, we don't have to re rely on those every six months, every 12 months employee satisfaction <laughs> surveys. Keep doing them. Keep doing them because of the course. HRV will only supplement that. But now you can walk in in the morning if you get everybody taking their HRV every morning. How's my organization doing today? How is my team doing today? How, am, how are my individual employees doing this week? Now all of a sudden we can say, hey, we can quantify this in a way that was just really unimaginable at any kind of scale, even just a couple of years ago. And that's the really exciting thing is how well is an organization, a manager, a leader doing at this model to get to those great outcomes. And boy, if stress is what's preventing you, HRV is going to tell you that. Now, again, even if HRV is good and everybody is healthy, that's where, to me, this is just the fun part of leadership. That yeah, is right. where recognition, accountability, uh, shared vision, strategic plans, you have all the capacity now as a leader, you need to focus on that, on what gets you the best results. But hey, if we can get there, Jeff, that's just fun, right? <laughs> that is, as somebody who's dealt in with like burnout and try and just keep people healthy. Oh man, when you're able to get a healthy uh, with that engagement capacity, oh, then it's just, then it's fun because you can just let people, you know, you give that focus and then you let people go. They, then they they achieve great things. And, and to me, that's why leadership is so much fun. Uh, but it takes a lot of work to get there. And hey, let us uh, help you measure that. Uh, especially, okay. we're recording this uh, January 15th, 2021. And uh, yeah, uh, we got to understand that the cogs in the machine, so to speak, that the business world loves to think about employees. There's so much in the world right now with a pandemic, with political unrest, with a racial uh, equality, that so many people are walking in and I, I will admit my own self, I don't wake up in the morning in my best spot right now. And it's probably because I watch way too much news, <laughs> but I want to see if I, I kind of feel Sorry. like for my safety, I need to know what's going on in the world to some extent, uh, yep. you know, and support all the people that uh, look to me to, to do so and talk about trauma. But you, you know, we, we need this model right now. And again, if you want to quantify it way beyond getting a glimpse every six months on how folks are doing, uh, you know, reach out to us. Uh, one of the reasons we created this is we know a healthy workforce is going to get positive outcomes. And if positive outcomes are, uh, you know, whether it's writing great code and creating great software, whether it's your patients getting world-class healthcare, whether it's your clients getting the best trauma treatment they can, whether it's you know, a case manager helping people get into permanent housing. All this relies on employee health and wellness. So uh, yeah, we would love to talk to you. And if enough people reach out, maybe Jeff will allow me to stop searching person by person. Save me, save me. HRV increase significantly. <laughs> It has hit the red this week later on. And uh, while I was thinking it might have been the political unrest in our country, uh, maybe it's just you, Jeff. Maybe it's just uh, you. Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> and with that, my friend, I think it's a wrap. <laughs> awesome. Hey, I, Thanks, I, I just want to shout out to both podcasts, uh, traumainformlens.org, uh, optimalhrv.org. And just a reminder to both, um, while this Model did make it in the first version of our book. If you pick up uh, our, our heart rate variability book, it will go into this in a lot more detail and really help you integrate uh, HRV as well as looking at the best practices for leadership as well. So, uh, hey, take care of yourself, everybody, because the life demands right now, I, I know, are overwhelming a lot of us. That's it. Thanks, everybody.